start recording now. Okay, so just quickly, if you just came in and there's still some people coming in, uh, you're very welcome to a question of scale. Uh, this project that is really exploring the potential of a community-led cooperative approach to regional resilience. We have some great speakers today that I'll be introducing, um, but just of a sense that we have uh, Stanka Vicheva from Friends of the Earth Europe, and we have Dirk Holmans from, he's currently the president, co-president of the Green European Foundation. We have Sean McCabe uh, from TASC. Uh, we have Dr. Oliver Moore, my colleague here with Cultivate and Art 2020. Uh, Liam McGinley uh, from Glen Column Pill on the, the relevance of McDyer's work um, from the 50s. Uh, and we have um, Sinead Mercier, uh, re a researcher really exploring the, um, the just transition. So as we're going to be uh, moving to an introduction from Tommy Simpson, my colleague, Green Foundation Ireland, uh, and Jonathan Essex, who's from the Greenhouse Think Tank, who are also doing an event in this bigger series uh, on Friday that we will be participating in as well. Oh, so without any further ado, there's still people coming in. Uh, I'm <coughs> going to hand over to Tommy um, to introduce uh, our, our, our event here. So Tommy, over to you. Oh. Uh, thanks very much, Davey. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, just uh, this is, uh, I find this uh, idea, uh, working with yourself, a very exciting project uh, because the history of it is, uh, comes from, uh, basically from Dirk Collimans, who's, who's going to be talking later, uh, when he ran a workshop for the Green European Foundation and the uh, project he entitled uh, Reindustrialization. Uh, sociological eco reindustrialization, which was the start of all of this idea of showing what's possible that you can do possible things that you can do at a local level that you couldn't do before and all of this comes about and that was followed on by Jonathan Essex who will also be talking uh, about the idea that uh, sustainability is much it can be further advanced at a local level rather than at a city or industrial city level. So um, this is the whole basis of it. And ever since the um, the invention of the consumers could buy black and decker drills to now we have 3D printers, it is possible to do things at the local level that were not possible, say, 20 years ago. And I always remember very briefly Dirk talking about parts for motorbikes that he was uh, had to wait a long time to get and uh, he was uh, nowadays you can download the drawings and print out the parts with your 3d printer that was impossible even 10 years ago so with, there are all sorts of possibilities now to show at the local level the, uh, the, the, the question of scale and scale of course as uh, Davy has mentioned stands for supply chains and local economies and that's where the the idea came from we want to show that uh, in rural ireland and rural everywhere that small towns and villages can do things now and be more sustainable than uh, than ever before and not have the energy requirements that are uh, in cities if you like so uh, and also we will be sh uh, demonstrating today some practical uh, possibilities and historical possibilities such as um, Glenn Column Kill, this amazing uh, priest which uh, Liam McGinley will introduce uh, where it showed even in, uh, in the 60s and 70s that uh, it, these ideas of cooperation and community and worker cooperatives were possible. So uh, I'll leave it at that for now and, and, and contribute. Our partners in this are uh, the lead partner is Greenhouse, which is a UK, uh, the Greenhouse think tank in UK, led by Jonathan Essex and, and Peter Sims. Uh, also, our other partners are in the Netherlands, uh, is Evert, uh, I can't pronounce his name, Nevenhuis, and they're with their, their foundation is called Wettenschaft 
like, like uh, part of Green Links. So they're the three partners, all funded by the Green European Foundation and uh, all with a similar theme. And I think Jonathan will probably explain the overall theme of this. Thank you. Over to you, Jonathan. Okay, um, thank you, Davy, and, and thank you, Tommy. And so just to follow on from that and say that this is indeed part of a multi-country Green European Foundation-led uh, project, which is titled A Climate Emergency Economy. So while climate motions have been passed by councils across numerous countries, the question this project looks to answer is, what about the hard to reach sectors that need to be looked at at the national level with international linkages? Um, what do we do about those if we are to you know, ch have change programs in these areas um, to make sure we reach zero carbon for our economies as a whole? Well, the three country teams, they've explored three different aspects of this. Uh, transition to zero carbon. Firstly, uh, the Dutch team have looked at industry, an oft forgotten sector, and, you know, ha and, and looked at how you uh, shift the economy um, to deal with that. Secondly, um, this, this team here in, in Ireland is looking at you know, how we shift from an economy uh, directed at maximising its export potential to maybe firstly prioritising livelihoods and well-being locally, uh, aptly titled A Question of Scale. And finally, uh, Greenhouse Think Tank uh, have spent the first six months of this project literally dissecting the trade, transport, carbon footprint to the UK to see what needs to change in terms of our physical global linkages around the world. So it kicked off with the Dutch and, and Groin Links. Um, they, they conducted an industry round table to engage industry leaders and politicians in Holland to see you know, what would a zero carbon industry look like and the thing that fascinated me was, was the, the combination of the technical challenge, which they set out as combining a circular economy with zero carbon, and then what the political challenges of responding to it might look like. And I think, you know, to, to create a, 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 a circular economy that is a climate emergency economy at the same time, that very much points to what is happening here today, the, the, the need to relocalize or shorten supply chains to make sure that consumption and production are much more joined up. Um, and, and in doing so, you know, we create a local circular economy, not a continuation of the global business as usual. Which brings us on, I think, just to briefly introduce what we're doing uh, on Friday in, in the greenhouse session. And, and, and I'll put a, a link to that in the chat shortly well what we did is we we said well how does this all link together so firstly we spent some time drawing together the 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 findings and, and the discussions in ireland and in the uk and and in the netherlands to produce what we've called a trade and investment toolkit to say well let's think hard and deep about what we need to enable and what we need to see as blockages if we want to really transform what underpins business as usual that we want to shift. Otherwise, we may all focus on climate emergency motions at our local councils without seeing the big picture economics change too. And just one snippet from this, we've shown that the average ton of goods traded, that's imports and exports, with all the countries that link the UK outside of the EU with our trade, are on average five times more carbon intensive than the transport emissions uh, of, of our trade within the European Union, including with Ireland. Um, so please join us on Friday. We're going to discuss the findings of this report and summarise the overall project without bringing, before bringing together a panel, uh, uh, mainly of MEPs and, and uh, a trade uh, campaign uh, activist uh, to see, you know, what should we do and what are the wider political findings of this project. So without further ado, I'll hand you back to Davy. Um, and to find a little bit more about a question of scale. Brilliant, Jonathan. Thanks for that. Thanks everyone for being here. We're really going to use the chat today. So uh, we want to capture insights, anything we can add to the longer paper, other sections, uh, and anything that we capture today, especially around uh, the enablers and blockers, which we're going to move into now. So, in our, oh sorry, one slide too far. In our uh, events, we really want to make them participative and engaging. Obviously that is difficult uh, with the current pandemic. 
Uh, but we're going to do just a quick uh, breakout to groups of pairs uh, and with just one objective, to speak and listen. Uh, so when we're speaking, we're sharing who we are concisely and something you observe that blocks or enables shorter supply chains or stronger local economies. So this is something that we really want to capture in the chat from your little harvest here in pairs. Uh, so it's three minutes each. The person with the shortest hair when you come into the room, just to make it quick, can start. So you'll have three minutes, switch around and listen for three minutes, sharing who you are and something you observe that blocks or enables uh, shorter supply chains or local economies. So hopefully that's clear enough um, from the, the slide now. I'm just gonna put you into breakout rooms and in six minutes, I'll bring you back. So have a good conversation, but please, if we could capture out uh, in the chat, anything that could help us see what might enable or block uh, this idea of uh, shorter supply chains and local economy. So I'm sending you to the breakout rooms now. Hopefully uh, they're even enough. If you get lost, don't panic. Um, you may have to have a conversation with someone you've not met before, but that will be good. Enjoy your conversations now, and we'll see you back here in about six minutes. Baby, can you hear me? Hello. I, the thing went off the screen too quickly. Oh, here it is. Just anything that enables uh, your long supply, um, anything that enables or blocks a move to shorter supply chains. So don't panic, have a good conversation, whatever happens. If you've just arrived, you're getting put into a breakout room to look at what you observe might uh, block or enable shorter supply chains or local economies. You should go into a room automatically. Uh, if you don't, like uh, I can see Joan isn't assigned. Let's see if we can help, but don't panic. You needed help, you're on your own. <laughs> uh, Roisin, let, um, let me see if I can get you into another breakout room, but don't panic. And just consider what might block or enable on your own there, and I'll see if I can get you into another uh, group there. Oh, I think uh, I, I got sent to a room with just myself and I came back. Yeah, yeah. I was in a, yeah. Well, that happened to me too. I found I was in a room on my own. And I, I, yes, these are I the things. I anyone there. <laughs> Nothing happened, so I came back. <laughs> yeah, but sure, we're all here now. How many of us are here? That's me, Sean, uh, Ollie, Sean, Janice. Who else? Roisin. Roisin. We can see now. Okay, yeah. Um, any more? Any more? Is this four of us, is it? There seems to oh, be no. a few more, but maybe they're muted. Yeah, Davy is here. Um, Should we can all there, introduce people ourselves? Muted. Do people want to say hello um, and unmute if they realise where they are? <laughs> um, we can just start anyway. Because I'm going to be talking twice later, I feel like I shouldn't really talk much now at all. And another thing I'll say before I stop saying anything is that the, um, the enablers and blockers aren't really in this paper yet. So it would be interesting to hear what people can, can come up with. And if somebody's using a computer, it would be great if they could um, 
they could throw it into the chat maybe because I'm using a phone. So that, that's, but yeah, we could spend a few minutes talking about enablers and a few minutes talking about blockers. Um, if anyone wants to kick the ball off. Did, was that audible? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in, but I'm conscious, Ali, that I'm also going to be talking. So, um, but I'd say uh, supermarkets are a major blocker of local supply chains. Okay, yeah. Um, what about super value? I think, well, I think it all depends on the, the proliferation of, of the, um, the multiples that seek um you know the 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 um minimizing local impact and maximizing profit what i describe as an extraction supermarket mm. rather than you know i suppose super value does have some advantages yeah i mean they are the one who have tried to position themselves as being supporting smaller scale local producers developing they also have they tend to let them have their own brands as well rather than say the Marks and Spencer's model is complete vertical integration mm -hmm. so that there is no identity for a producer outside of the Marks and Spencer's kind of labeling system um, and look and so on. So it's interesting as to where they're like, you know, and in places like Cork, um, there's a lot of food business incubation done via some of the super values, you know, yeah. um, like Middleton, uh, Clonakilty, you know, a lot of food okay. businesses would go from Middleton farmers markets into Middleton super value and then onto the regional and then national scale. So I guess what you're seeing in, in somewhere like Clando is a very strong cooperative system mm. as well that supports that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And probably a stronger food production kind of culture maybe as well than some parts of Ireland have. Anybody else have an idea on that? Um, Supermarkets as, an, as constrainers of resilient local communities. There's a lot of people on mute who might not even know they're in this room. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried. We'll be yeah. in a second, Ollie. So just whatever we can capture is a okay. whole, a one one blockage supermarkets okay. do you anymore yeah sean this is tesco's that's what we just put <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm perfectly okay with that yeah <laughs> okay i'm gonna mute okay. myself because so hi I, i'm roisin i'm based down in north wexford and i've been really looking at food systems i've done a bit of future scoping and worked as a thinking partner with um big industrial food producers and policymakers. So um, on a regional level, I, I think one of, the, in, one of the blockers is not knowing where to go to find out information about local food producers. And in this age of digital, we think it's easy, but it's actually still quite hard to find local food producers, local good quality food producers. So like a year ago, I went on this mission to find a veg box supplier. Um, I live rurally, um, I live near a very small village, and even to find people growing food within our community that might have gluts or might be willing to share or barter has been a bit of a challenge. So even uh, talking about like, uh, I tried to, I, this year I was hoping to start a seed saver or a seed swap I, concept. And obviously COVID has like made things even more tricky. So in terms of, of local um, supply chains, I think we sh we think in that one of the enablers is technology, but it actually might be a blocker as well. So it's finding yeah. the finding the food producers, finding you know a way to like in shortening the food chains. I think you you shorten things like packaging and processing as well, and it's finding a way to tap in at that earlier stage in in the food system so that you can make a link to to the value earlier on in the food chain. Okay, so do you want to um, type something into the um, chat about um, accessing information on local and regional uh, food producers in the chat? Because co this conversation is going to finish in about 20 seconds. So if you can stick that in the chat. And Sean, if you want to summarize your supermarket point with a super value nuance, 
uh, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, leave this, I'll leave this now. So do use the chat, please. Um, people will be joining us back in the main room where we currently are in, in a few minutes. Uh, and our hope is that we would have in the chat now a huge list of blockers and enablers that we can bring into this uh, longer illustrated paper that we're going to be uh, looking at. Yeah, well, I, I'm afraid I paid it wrong because I went into the breakout room and nobody else turned up. So I came back and I thought when I came back that I couldn't go back to the breakout room. So I've just, I just haven't done anything, I'm afraid. Don't you panic, Janice. Just relax. And if <laughs> any thoughts of enablers or blockers of a local economy and short supply chains, put it in the chat. Everyone can do that now. Okay, so we are we all back? I think we might all be back from the rooms. Okay, my apologies if you got stuck on your own. Uh, my apologies if uh, there was a little confusion there of what we were doing. I'm hoping that we would have a list in the chat now of blockers and enablers that we could bring in now to this longer article that we're going to be doing. So uh, the opportunity was just to be able to speak. Um, it, there's a lot of people in this room that are holding some amazing uh, perspectives and uh, contributions that could be here. So please introduce yourself in the chat as well. I know a lot of you have been working in this area for a long time. Uh, our objective is to, from these conversations, bring in uh, more inputs uh, to this article that we're um, reading or doing. But I might... Um, just hand over to Ollie now, just to give you a sense of what's just in the article quickly and what we're doing, building up into um, something longer, illustrated and palatable. We really want to make uh, uh, this information about how we might build this resilience in our regions, make this just transition, uh, but we really want to make that accessible, not an academic paper. So our illustrated larger paper that will come out of this event, along with uh, a podcast in November, uh, will be the end of this project. So I'm gonna pass to Ollie now. Ollie, you're on. Uh, just give us a sense of the paper and our process. Yeah, hi everybody. So yeah, the paper we've started, which has been circulated, and we can drop a link into the chat as well. The paper is just really an introduction to some ideas that might help us with this notion of building regional resilience. Um, so what we do is really we start with an, a very brief outlining of the current crises. Uh, so COVID-19 plus the biodiversity, uh, climate change and other multiple interlocked and interlocking uh, crises. And then we make a tentative suggestion that the social and solidarity economy and our ecological economics could be two ways to frame or house some of these kind of regional responses. So then within those kind of theoretical ideas, then we have specifics. And people who are on this call and others who aren't on this call have made contributions to those sections and they'll be talking later. But just to give you a brief and quick outline, uh, Noreen uh, Byrne and Carol Power from UCC, from the Center for Cooperative Studies, they described co-ops in the more traditional and straightforward sense. Uh, cooperatives have a long and interesting history. Uh, you know, the dairy co-ops are instrumental in getting Ireland um, established, um, in a sense, uh, economically, because they came about after the land wars and, you know, were very instrumental in developing the power of production and distribution uh, controlled by Irish farmers. So they, they talk a little bit about that, but primarily about the benefits of federated co-ops, of co-ops working together. Um, and the example we use in the paper is of um, the, the five co-ops in the Carberry network in um, West Cork who pay farmers better than anyone else, um, even though they're five quite small co-ops in terms of the milk price. Um, so as well as the, um, the traditional kind of co-ops, we also then, Sean, who's here on the call today, Sean McCabe, um, has a small section on community wealth building, which is about integrating institutional players into um, these regional resilience approaches. 
Uh, so he refers to the Cleveland model and the Preston model, and hopefully we could develop something similar here. Um, I then write about um, some new approaches to um, co-ops co and cooperation and collaboration. I try to stick to agri-food primarily. Um, I won't talk too much about this bit because this bit is the bit I'm doing later, but it's about things like the Open Food Network and about machinery co-ops, about CSAs, about um, land sharing um, initiatives and so on. So we, we've really just given kind of a taster or a pointer towards, look, here's, here's, a, here's a, a problem area, here's a solution area, here's some theoretical frames, and here's how some practical examples of things that we've seen around the place that seem to be contributing um, to the potential for uh, regional resilience. But it's just a taster, it leaves out lots of things. We talk about what's left out to some extent at the end of the paper, like um, hopefully she was on the call today could add a section on just transition, for example. But things that are happening in the chat right now are actually the things that will start to come into the paper as well. And it'll be a longer, more detailed, more comprehensive paper with some illustrations as well. Um, so it'll be a, a more interesting thing in the end, more collaborative as it should be, and we'll have a multimedia dimension in terms of um, aesthetics and podcast and so on as well. Brilliant, Ollie. So you get a sense of what the bigger project is. It's not just this event. We're trying to build a case for this cooperative community-led approach. Thank you so much for the blockers and enablers in the chat. And uh, let's use chat as much as we can to share insights for the next. We're going to have five very short uh, presentations to open this up, the scope of this up a little. Any insights, or if there is questions, also put them in, in the, the chat. So our first presenter is... Um, from, the, from Europe, uh, he has been uh, a, lo a local politician. Uh, he's the co-president of the Green Europe Foundation and he's the coordinator of OICOS, a think tank that strives for social ecological change by feeding the social debate with inspiring publications, uh, information and lectures and uh, conferences. So uh, Dirk is gonna just make uh, Give us a small piece. I have his slides here. So Dirk, you don't have to uh, have your, your slides, but I'll just spotlight your video. So hand it over to Dirk. Resilience under shock, time for a paradigm change. Dirk. Where are you, Dirk? Okay, so now you can hear me. Many thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think it's a great project. I think local economies are the future. Um, and so what I will do in these eight minutes is highlight a few points from an article I wrote for the Green European Journal, which is also accessible on the site uh, of the journal uh, Resilience on the, on the Shock. I wrote it uh, in the third month of the COVID crisis, but I think that for developing an alternative progressive narrative, the concept of resilience is, is very uh, crucial. Um, because of course, uh, Corona is only one shock, but we know there will come other shocks or maybe with climate crisis, you can already say uh, we will have a kind of cascade of different shocks. So we have to make our system resilient, which means that it continues to function when there are shocks. And also very important, a resilient system is proactive. It's able to avert shocks. And we're not talking here about uh, persons, we are talking about systems, social ecological systems that we have to reorganize. And you could say that now our global society is one big social ecological system. What we do influences natural systems and nature also reacts. So we are in a constant complex situation of uh, interactions. I will now shortly present four components of resilience. The first is the importance of short feedback loops. Uh, in a resilient system, we get information on the consequences of our actions very fast. Now, the, interest, the interesting point was that at the beginning of the corona crisis, many people said, now look how fast society is reacting to the corona crisis. Why don't we react as fast related to the climate crisis. But I think it's more complex because I think the cause for the two crises is the same. 
It's our neoliberal economy that is destroying our ecosystems. It is because of the destruction of the forests and our economy, we get climate crisis, but also the destruction of the forests led to the emergence of uh, viruses that, are, that come through animals to us. So I think there, uh, we, to tackle both uh, crises, we need system thinking, we need shorter feedback loops. And so my proposal here is that we have to adapt the, the weather forecast we see every day on the news with a chapter on climate news every day. So we're informed every day. That's uh, very short on the first component, the importance of short feedback. The second component is modularity. And you see here three systems. And so the, the system to the left with green dots and one central hub is how we organize our economy. For instance, more than half of the mold masks we now really need are produced in China. So you can understand this is a very vulnerable system. If the central node uh, doesn't function anymore or doesn't deliver, the total system is in danger. On the other hand, if we move to the right, to the blue system, where everything is connected with everything, this is also not a resilient system because, uh, and COVID is of course a good example, if there's something wrong in one part of the system, it will move very fast through all the system. So what we need is a kind of modular system, which you see in the center, uh, where you have subsystems that are not too much linked with each other. And so if you think about our economy, we are now in the system to the left with China in the center. And so what we have to do, we have to move to regional circular, circular economies, which will make our system much more resilient because if there's something wrong, wrong in one part of the system, it will not affect the overall system. I think this is really an essential point. I move to the third component of resilience, which is diversity. And it's actually very, very easy to explain, but still with the, our global economy is really organized in the wrong way. And if you think about a farm, if you only have one crop on your fields, then it's, your, your yield, your harvest is very vulnerable to diseases. And actually how we have organized our economy with only one dominant approach, the neoliberal market monoculture is also a kind of very stupid way of organizing. It's not resilient. If there goes something's wrong, your whole economy, your global supply chains, they uh, go wrong. So what we need is just as on a farm, we need diversity, economic diversity, which means uh, also public services, which means cooperatives, ethical and diverse regional economies. So this means that we are much more able to resist certain crises. Maybe one year, a part of our economy will be hit by a crisis, but then another part will still uh, be functioning and a year later, it can be the other way around. But to build diversity, also institutional diversity in our economy, you have market players, you have more uh, citizen-led initiatives, scopes, you have the state, public authorities organizing things. And with this diversity, we will, much, we will be much more uh, resilient. Then the last component of resilience, which for some people is a bit uh, strange, it's social capital. Uh, what we are told in the news every day, what people learn at school is that we are a homo economicus. You have to work hard, you shouldn't care about other people, you are rational and just work hard and get rich. Uh, but now with uh, the corona crisis, we saw a totally different picture of, of society. We saw people willing to help other people, people being lonely at home. When the global economy was not able to provide us masks, all over the world, people were producing masks for their neighbors. And so I'm 
really convinced that this social capital has allowed that societies are still standing now and without this social capital even more people would have suffered from the corona crisis and so we really have to invest in this social capital which is not only about the practical help it's also about what kind of resources network can generate it's about emphasis on values such as solidarity social involvement and so forget about the homo economicus i think we in the future we have to talk about the homo coherence and i think if we put emphasis on these four components of resilience we can move we can uh, develop another uh, more localized with sustainable uh, economy and the good news is that already for the last 15 years citizens are taking a lot of initiatives developing establishing new commons so i think the building blocks for a new regionalized resilient economy is already here we just have to connect the dots so i hope this was a short introduction and please if you want to read more you can find my article on the website of the green european journal thanks Brilliant, uh, Dirk. That was a really important framing, I think, uh, and it resonates well because we use uh, the framing of resilience as well in a, in a lot of our work. Uh, please keep any reflections or insights from each of these speakers in the chat, especially things that we might develop more in the longer illustrated article. Next up, we have from Ireland, Sinead Mercier. Uh, Sinead's been a researcher on climate change law and policy with a, a special focus on the just transition and human right approaches. And so uh, Sinead's got eight minutes to sort of introduce uh, the maybe a broader uh, perception or definition of the, the just transition. So Sinead, are you ready to unmute and share your screen? Or you're not sharing a screen, but just unmute. I'm trying to find you so I can spotlight you. There you are. Uh, so, Sinead. Great. Um, I can't seem to screen share, no. Uh, that, that's okay. Okay, that's all right. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Dirk, as well. That was very interesting, especially about the, the move from homo economicus to cooperativist. Um, definitely would agree. Um, unfortunately, I did have a series of nice slides, which I can share with you. Um, but just quickly to, I'll just give a very quick overview. So just transition, as I suppose, the, the dominant language that we're hearing at the moment, we're, we're hearing that because in 2015 in the Paris Agreement, it was mentioned in the preamble alongside human rights and climate justice as well. And the phrase that was used there that taking into account the imperatives of a just transition, the workforce and creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development opportunity priorities. So basically when, when countries are reducing their emissions to keep global warming between 1.5 to 2 degrees, they should ensure that nobody is left behind and can keep them with the sustainable development goals, no one loses their jobs. And where this language comes from um, is actually a long line of work by trade unionists across the world, but particularly in Western countries and particularly in the, in the anti-nuclear movement. Um, so again, kind of green politics and trade union politics around just transition are very much linked. Um, there's a brilliant person called Tony Mizaki who campaigned um, as part of the Oil, Chemical and Atomic, Atomic Workers Union in the US. And he uh, campaigned as part of the Ban the Bomb peace movement in the US. And he proposed that atomic workers would not be left behind, that they would gain access to skills and to um, basically a new GI Bill. So the GI Bill after the Second World War, where he himself benefited from free university education after coming back from World War II. So he proposed a super fund for dirt and workers in, in a line with just transition. So the phrasing comes from that long history of environmental, health and safety, scientists and trade union groups working together to stop black lung disease and so on. Um, however, you also have a wider context uh, which is, again, kind of the language of a just transition from one age of man's history to the next, which was a phrase mentioned by the president of Mexico, Lopez Portillo, at the 34th Un uh, United Nations General Assembly in 1979. And the importance of the language of just transition in this context was that countries such as Mexico, who were resource dependent on 
on exporting fossil fuels from their countries to wealthier ones. They became um, heavily indebted and they became, they suffered from La Deca Decade Perdida, the, the lost decade in Latin America, where they went into massive debt because they were reliant on exporting their goods. And they then had to be subject to structural adjustment and neoliberal kind of austerity policies. And this is very important in our current context because that language of energy as a right, as a public good that developing nations should not simply be extracted from um, is very important for us today as we face into continued liberalization and privatization of energy around the world. Um, what has actually happened with privatization, which started under the Pinochet dictatorship in, the 19, in 1982 in Chile, that privatization and liberalization that was then exported from that American structural adjustment was then exported around the world. And that's actually where the call for just transition comes from, because that privatization and liberalization in Europe, in South Africa, in other countries, it actually resulted in a very, very unjust transition, which we know of from, say, the miners in Wales. Uh, it also happened in Poland as well, that privatization of many parts of the economy with the fall of the Berlin Wall has led to a concentration of trade union membership in very, very few sectors of the economy, such, and, such as coal, and um, is one of the last bastions of it. And also in Germany as well, and in Ireland too, um, and in Australia as well, a 90% drop in Australia in jobs um, due to privatization of the energy system. And what has also happened alongside that, not only job losses occurred, but you also had a rise in energy prices in many parts of the world. So many people thought that privatization would lead to lower energy prices. In some contexts it did, and it also was argued for on the basis of the liberalization allowing for more influx of renewable energy. But energy prices um, in Ireland, for example, r r rose quite dramatically after the 1990s when privatization of the ESB and breaking it up uh, started to occur. Now we still have the ESB, but it's now shared amongst a few other companies. Um, and this is kind of a very interesting situation because what I'm trying to discuss here with um, this group is, is community ownership enough in this context? Is community ownership of energy, what does it mean? What is its current context? In, us, in Scotland, for example, the Orkney Islands, they have um, the highest amount of community energy, I believe, in Scotland, in Europe, so much that they're able to break hydrogen to run buses off it. However, they also have the highest rate of energy poverty in Scotland and one of the highest rates in Europe. And we are similar here in Ireland with the highest rate of energy poverty in Europe. And we are now looking at um, increasing community ownership of the energy system. However, what is community ownership? Is it allowing a few people with resources to be able to invest in a community-owned wind farm and have that on their property? Are they just participating in a system which has been neoliberalized and privatized in many parts as well? Or is it truly um, about resilience, about an entire community's resilience? Are we ensuring that our community energy ownership and discussions of energy is alongside a plan for those who are in dire energy poverty? For example, Irish travellers who live in culturally appropriate accommodation, which is low quality accommodation because of racism and other factors, 77% of them are in dire energy, are in severe energy poverty, which means they spend far more than 10% of their income on fuel, on running generators and so on. Um, and I have to ask, what is our plan as kind of greens? or environmentalists, because energy efficiency, again, um, I know Kieran Cuff has worked on it and, and has introduced um, work at a European level, which is brilliant, but the European Green Deal is in a context of cost efficiency first and the social pillar of, um, of, of rights second. And this opens up questions for us from a strategic point of view. Are we prepared, do we have plans for that kind of more revolutionary, for that more kind of, um, sustainable development goals approach of looking after the most vulnerable in communities and bringing them alongside our action and um, do we have a plan to to tackle energy poverty besides kind of ad hoc 
energy efficiency schemes. Energy efficiency, there's a written book called Burn Up by Simon Cranny, and he charts the development or lack of development of energy efficiency precisely because of this kind of very growth-based energy system, no matter whether it's renewables or whether it's fossil fuels. If you have a growth-based renewable energy, um, energy system, uh, energy efficiency, which is the first fuel, uh, deprives companies of income. Uh, and he kind of charts how energy efficiency has never quite developed precisely for that reason. So this is a challenge, I suppose. There are communities to be developed as a community focus. But it's also a, a larger focus about what our energy systems are for. What is a right to energy? Is it a right for those with resources to build wind farms? Or is it a right to everyone to free energy um, that's clean, that benefits them, that benefits the environment around them? And that's a conversation I would like to kind of open up and discuss um, a bit more. Uh, for me, I feel that uh, we need to kind of be careful that we are not being co-opted as, as environmentalists, as kind of green thinkers. We need to be careful that we are looking for, forward in an international manner and in a manner that kind of has the most vulnerable at heart and has their concerns at heart. So I would be interested in discussing that. And if anyone, I'm going to contribute to a paper as well on the origins and definitions of just transition. Um, I know I've meet, reached eight minutes now, but I will just quickly say that um, there's also a wider context of kind of inequality too. So um, we do realize that affluence is, is a greater contributor to climate change um, than perhaps kind of uh, consumer-based taxes or consumer-based focus. Uh, and also the kind of language of rights is very important uh, increasingly after the climate case as well. Uh, the United States, for example, is partly the reason why the Kyoto Protocol um, has flexible mechanisms, market-based mechanisms to tap into climate change and that kind of more rights-based approach such as the loss and damage mechanism being based on compensation, not just charity. Uh, that's the UNFCCC loss and damage uh, mechanism. I think this is an important conversation for us to have to move away from missions trading into kind of rights and that language. So thanks very much. Thanks, Sinead. Um, that was a really interesting. Um, please, as people have been doing, add any insights from uh, the speakers or questions into the chat. We're going to have time um, to hear some of those insights or go a bit deeper. But our objective here is to pull out things that we can bring into this a bigger illustrated paper. Let's keep going with our speakers. Next up, we have Sean McCabe. Uh, Sean's been working with TASC. Uh, before that, he worked with the Mary Robinson. Uh, foundation in climate justice for five years um, and he's uh, led the foundation's work on intergenerational quality. He's been um, working, Sean's developing a work stream on just transition with TASC uh, which is an independent think tank if you're from outside Ireland you might not have heard them, uh, an independent think tank whose mission is to address inequality and sustain democracy by trans Relating analysis into action. They do fantastic work. Sean's been working on a new report for TASC on community wealth building. Uh, we see community wealth building in places like Cleveland and Preston, and we see a huge opportunity for a regional approach to community wealth building. And Sean, you're going to give us a bit of an introduction into what that might mean and how it might play a part in strengthening our regional resilience. So over to you, Sean. Thanks, Davey. I'll just share my screen here if that's all right. Can everybody see that? Let me just start the slideshow. You guys got that there? So um, it's a pleasure to follow Sinead on this, actually, because um, Sinead has really laid out all of, all of the, the challenges that we're facing. And, and, and they're so um, complex and interrelated that it's easy sometimes to get overwhelmed by it. Uh, this did start as a piece of research uh, between TASC and, and FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, into uh, community wealth building. What it's really changed into is looking at how do we create the enabling environment for a just transition, as Sinead has laid it out. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on this, Sinead has mentioned the Paris Agreement. That's it in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, um, TASC brought out a report this time last year on inequality in Ireland, and it found that the agricultural sector was the most unequal in Ireland in terms of income. Um, 
on the back of that, I set off uh, on a journey around the country and, and met as many um, communities and, and, and uh, people involved in the producti in produ production of, of or, or transforming our natural resources into um, uh, products as, as, as I could and, and listening to their point of view. And I also had the good fortune of running in an election campaign and listening to people's concerns on doors. And that, that really did have a big shaping on, on how I thought about this project itself as well. Um, so this is the IPCC's uh, 1.5 report, and we're all familiar with the curves um, that the science has produced in terms of the mitigation pathways necessary to avoid uh, catastrophic climate change. What I guess we don't think of often when we look at curves is what, what's happening behind them. So, so the transforming of the employment landscape, which is what Sinead spoke so well about in terms of the trade union involvement in, in conceptualizing a just transition. And then the, the subsequent consequences for local communities, the impact on regional development and um, underlying social and cultural challenges, which are so, so significant in Ireland. And then the underlying inequality as well, which really, um, I, to my mind, is, is the most important element of all this. And so, so will we create a, a positive story or a story of hardship through the transformation? I think one place to start, and this is quite important, um, is the perception of, of public trust in governments um, as an element of, of enabling a just transition. So here, here is a plot of um, the perceptions of corruption index on, on the y-axis against um, the climate uh, climate action essentially on, on the x-axis and we see um, that countries with the most to do in terms of climate action actually suffer from from the most significant lack of trust in uh, government processes and um, so this leads me to what i would consider um, a complacency uh, paradox we, we've got two kind of dominant narratives around how we take climate action uh, one is that we will wait until public opinion is sufficient, uh, the supportive of climate action to, to, to move. And the second is that we will implement climate action from the top down. And um, the first actually uh, is an incorrect assumption, I would argue, because people's awareness of climate action doesn't necessarily mean that they support uh, the measures required. Uh, and then on, on the right hand side, um, you see here that Implementing top-down climate action, we saw it with the yellow vest, we saw it with the farmers in, in the Netherlands. It, it, it will stymie, it will stall. If you want climate action to be fast, it has to be fair. So we'll run out of time through both of those processes. Uh, so I guess this is where we come to the community wealth building dimension. Um, to garner social approval, climate action must drive local development. That's based on um, five assumptions. The first is that social approval is absolutely essential for climate action on the scale necessary to avoid the catastrophe we're facing. Um, Bottom-up policy formation is key to building that social approval. Um, communities just don't care about climate action. They never will, I don't think, in, in a time frame necessary to do what we need to do. So I'd almost be in favor of stopping talking about climate change and start talking about local development. And local development, that's... Uh, compatible with a 1.5 degree um, pathway. Um, communities do really want to participate and do want to have their voices heard and, and, and we have to make sure that that happens. And so this work that um, Cultivate are doing on, on community-led local development is, is very welcome and, and echoes a lot of what uh, this, this report that we're working on with TASC is pointing to. So just quickly, um, the conceptual framework that I'm, I, I'm using for the model that we're developing at TASC uh, is, is based quite heavily on Amarta Sen's development as freedom. Um, if we're to talk about what needs to be done, um, we have to, uh, in, in order to create an enabling environment, we have to expand choices and opportunities for individuals and for communities. Um, and that has to be meaningful. It comes back to what Sinead is saying about um, you know, what is, what is ownership of, of renewable energy services? Um, you know, what good is it if people are still, still living in poverty? And, and do we really intend to reach the furthest behind first as we're committed to through the SDGs? So, so all, all decision-making on climate action should embed uh, social inclusion, should enhance the sense of belonging, and should democratize natural, social, and economic resources. Um, 
in doing that, you will genuinely enhance the capacity of individuals to uh, co-design the climate action with you and, and to be your implementing partner. Uh, and you also will foster the social networks uh, that will uh, enhance communities' agency. Really, what we're talking about here is addressing power asymmetries. Uh, it's as simple as that. Now, unless we're doing that in everything, uh, then we're not going to succeed. So that brings us to the local wealth building. I genuinely think local wealth building or community wealth building, as it's referred to in the US, is a revolutionary concept. It's quite straightforward. It's that you take public expenditure and rather than handing it over to large corporations to fulfill orders for your hospitals or for your schools or, or what have you, you give it to communities. Um, you could take a very simple example um, of the new um, uh, TUD campus here in Dublin, which is taking buying all of its veg from Aramark. It would be very simple for, for TUD to buy its veg from North Dublin vegetable producers, and, and it would have a very significant impact on the lives of small producers. Um, so it's a very basic concept. The challenge with it is where it's been implemented in Cincinnati, in Preston, in Barcelona, um, it has to happen in communities where there is um, a large number of what are called anchor institutions, these municipally run institutions that can channel public investment. Um, now, there's a paucity of those in rural communities, um, and, and so how do we overcome this? Well, what, what I would argue is that we have an opportunity with climate action to create a type of temporary institution, a temporary anchor institution, um, that can accelerate uh, rural development. So if you look at the entire rural development program for Ireland from 2014 to 2020, it was 4.15 billion. That includes all the spending on leader. Um, and we're talking about a minimum, and this is an absolute minimum because it was in the uh, National Development Plan in, in 2020, of, uh, or in 2017, of around 30 billion over the next 10 years to be spent on climate action. I, I really think this is a low ball number that, um, because you, know, you could estimate about 90 billion of a spend is necessary just to retrofit our housing stock. So we're talking massive, massive public spending. And if that was diverted in the right way into genuine community empowerment, it would be transformative. But not only that, it would build communities capacity to act for themselves. It would create a virtuous cycle of um, public interest in climate action that would potentially allow us to take that action at the speed necessary to avoid absolute catastrophe. Um, just looking at, uh, briefly, be, I threw these slides in, Ali, after our, our chat earlier, just, just um, because, you know, I think it is important to consider the extractive nature of our current system. So on the bottom left and bottom right here, you have a, a farmer and you have a family. Um, now, the, the, the current um, system that links the farmer and the family is an extractive one. It basically passes cheap produce up to abattoirs or large PLC owned creameries um, or indeed just directly to the, the large multiples. Um, and then, then the families that are forced to shop there uh, can be time poor, can be cash poor. The edge of town supermarkets have proliferated at the same time as the gig economy um, and at the same time as the housing crisis. Uh, so basically this is a process of extraction that ultimately ends with a shareholder and the system that we'd like to move towards is something that looks more like this, where you have um, both the consumers and the producers uh, cooperatively engaged in, in the transfer of produce, where you have at the bottom here um, the type of uh, policy frameworks that, you know, let's take the family, for example, where you are, have a four day work week, where you have a living wage, where you have a right to housing, where these things inform uh, the lives or shape the lives of the family so that they are not completely. Uh, reliant on the large-scale multiples that offer bargain prices at, and push it all back on the farmer. There's more to this diagram, but I'll just I'm run out of time. Finally, and really quickly, this is the model that uh, I think we require to get us to where we need to go. So this is uh, what I'm kind of temporarily calling uh, community-led sustainable development. 
I see this as uh, the central pillar here, genuine community empowerment, participatory budgeting, uh, local participative fora that genuinely shape local development plans. None of this send off your submission into a black hole and, and hope that it informs something. Uh, where you have context appropriate education, which is genuinely emancipatory, which teaches people about their rights and, and their responsibilities. And then uh, you have community owned action and there's a variety of other things that play into that. But that's, that's, that's it, essentially. So thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot there and um, there's a lot more uh, depth to this as well. So there's a larger task report that's coming out and Sean's already got some piece in the initial shorter article that we're expanding through this event and through the insights that we're gathering uh, today. So any insights or signposts to other work that we might incorporate into this community-led cooperative approach to our regional resilience. And um, we're capturing those and we're gonna weave it in. Uh, next up, we have a good colleague of mine. He's a resident of Clog Jordan Eco Village. He is the Chief Communications Officer with ART 2020 at European level. He lectures in UCC in the Corporate Studies Unit. And um, he is uh, very active in our work with Cultivate that we're doing around uh, climate action framed in community-led development. So, Ollie Moore, we um, have your slides, if you want to just get started. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, so, on you go. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm just going to introduce a few of the things that are in the paper that you already have access to. Uh, they're just new approaches to co-ops and cooperatives, just ideas to get ourselves thinking, so, yeah. So these are those areas. So I'm going to talk about digital platforms um, and real life platforms. Uh, one from Belgium I'm going to introduce called SMART or SMART. I'm going to talk about machinery co-ops for farmers, digital farmers markets and their aggregation through the open food network, the technological sovereignty movement, which is, you know, farm hack and blog through paysan in France, and then land sharing initiatives, I'm calling them broadly, which, is, which are things like land trusts, land care and CSAs. So we'll have a look now at um, SMART, or SMART. Uh, it's a platform co-op in Belgium. So really what it's about is, um, you know, it's just about efficient um, aggregating of needs and services um, by people who work in the freelance sector. So they started quite early for um, a platform. They started in 1998 for uh, cultural and creative workers. So basically they assist freelancers to develop their own activity through a secure system and services, services include things like a co-working space, legal advice, and invoicing. So you can see here's a little quote from, from the organization. So you get to negotiate your, your, all your typical client work, um, but then, and then you kind of declare the project through the, the SMART website. Um, to validate the job, you have to return your contract to SMART, um, as does the client. And then they take it, this is the interesting bit, I suppose, now, um, so the, the co-op itself takes care of the social declaration, um, pays the different social contributions and taxes, and pays your salary um, seven days after the assignment is finished. So even if the client hasn't invoiced, uh, you still get paid because it's a co-op. So it's big enough to handle a few delays and a few early payments and so on. And it costs 30 quid a year and 6.5% of the overall costs of the thing. It's just a, of, the, of the work itself. So just an example of a, of a freelancer platform. So, yeah, and this is just a slide which you can have a look at later, which just explains in graphic form what they do, but it's about management, support, guidance, and career opportunities. So just an interesting way that producers have managed to aggregate value. Uh, so the next four I'm gonna talk about are agri-food examples. Um, the first one is more mainstream, and then the next three are more for agroecological, more resilience, uh, regenerative type farming approaches. But what's nice about this first one, this machinery co-op approach, is that machinery co-ops exist in some countries and it's very efficient because having you know 40 of everything for 40 farmers is inefficient so in france there's this um, initiative called kuma um, and most regions have kumas especially in Brittany and, and places like that which is very comparable to ireland in terms of dairy and climate and so on um, so the example here i've given uh, is uh, a kuma in western france they have They've been going for 37 years. They have 
there's 37 farmers with 45 pieces of machinery between them and I've listed the machinery they have. It's very much the standard stuff of um, mainstream large scale tillage and livestock production. But you can see that it's just very efficient to have all of that stuff. And the shed itself then sells electricity back into the national grid where all the machinery is housed. Members contribute to investments and running costs in proportion to the use they get from each machine. So you can see how it's um, a very efficient way to manage resources because the production of resources um, in itself is, is wasteful. So do you want to move on there, Debbie? Um, unless it's aggregated like that. So the, the, a very exciting new one um, is this uh, sort of aggregated pr for aggregation for producers through these digital farmers markets. So they've really come into their own with COVID, um, but they, they made sense anyway, especially for regions that were too small to manage a farmer's market. And while farmer's markets are great as a social hub, it costs producers a lot to staff each of the stalls. There are more efficient ways to do it. Um, you know, you can sketch your orders together on the phone um, and pick up on one day. And while there's fewer people employed in that, it makes it more viable for small scale producers, especially in very small rural areas like where we are here in Clot Jordan. So the Open Food Network is the example that we're, we're highlighting in the paper because of the fact that it's a social enterprise um, the code is owned by a charity um, and it's not uh, sort of an extractivist platform likely to be sold onto venture capitalists. Um, so yeah, you can move on there. Um, so that's just, and it's coming to Ireland as well, which is nice. Um, so, you know, it's already in Belfast and it's starting to come into the rest of Ireland and we're involved in trying to make that happen. So another example of collective or collaborative approaches to, um, to agri-food and this example and other ones are more from the agroecological end of the farming spectrum. So this is what I'm calling, which I've called in a paper for ARC 2020, uh, technological sovereignty. So this is a movement of farmers deciding to make kit that's appropriate to their agroecological farming setups. So rather than just buying expensive, high embodied energy um, devices, uh, it's about making appropriate machinery for mixed agroecological farming. And so the, in France, it's La Terrier Paysanne. And this is a quote from them. Um, a global movement is emerging of farmers rejecting locked away technology, sharing and tweaking their plans for building and modifying appropriate machinery for their ecological farming practices. Mixed agroecological farming requires new tools for seeding and weeding for washing and winnowing. Farm hackers are making them collectively. That's actually a quote from me, sorry, not from uh, Lanterior or Paysan. But the next um, slide will introduce the organization. Uh, we they, this is a, an, one of their gatherings, so as well, um, as, well as having um, the idea to make this appropriate machinery, and they share the plans then for how to design and tweak and develop and improve the appropriate machinery. They also hold events where they gather and teach each other how to make this equipment and machinery and buildings and so on um, better. So do you want to go on to the next slide there? You can see um, they have five trucks um, equipped with machinery materials needed to run 80 or so courses and workshops around the year. So it's self-built farmer-led machinery is their speciality. So it's, it's affordable, replicatable um, equipment that they're um, specializing in helping farmers develop for themselves. So Julian um, wrote an article for ARC 2020 on this, um, and he explains, we identify and document inventions and ad adaptations of tools created by farmers who have not waited for ready-made solutions from experts or the industry, but have invented or tweaked their own machinery. We seek to promote these farmer-driven innovations. Our internet forum, which acts like a collective sketchbook, is designed to make these contributions visible and accessible. We believe we can make technolo te sorry, we believe we can make technical choices and invent sophisticated low tech solutions. We don't want to be overwhelmed by trendy plug and play and miraculous high tech tools that will only make us more dependent, will be more intrusive and less controllable. There are some examples there as well in the slides um, and on the, um, in the paper of examples of what I'm calling land sharing initiatives. So these are all hyperlinkable, but they're also in the paper anyway. So you've got, 
initiatives like the um, land care movements, land trusts, peasants for nature in France, CSAs, and to an extent you can even define um, high nature value farming in this context. So it's about land sharing in some way that's not just purely production based <coughs> irrespective of consequence. So the next slide then will introduce um, some nice pictures from Claude Jordan um, of farming. So one third of our land is in these green manure cover crops um, at any one time because we're sharing the land with nature. Um, so this builds soil and helps with biodiversity. Um, our CSA is community owned and operated. CSA or community supported agriculture is about sharing risks, responsibilities and rewards of farming. So you can click through some of these images there, David, because it's just um, towards the end. So we also share, save seeds and work with the seed savers on open pollinated seeds that are specifically adapted to the microclimate we have here in Clot Jordan. Um, so again, that's an example of sharing and collaboration. Um, so, you know, those seeds end up producing plants that are super adapted to our specific soil types and the climate in our sort of micro region. Uh, but it's a community farm. There's dozens of us involved at any one time in doing the things of the farm. We have, you know, a dozen or so volunteers helping at any one time from all around Europe. Uh, and it was really interesting in the COVID context as well, seeing how the farm pulled itself together and dealt collectively with very fast, very awkward decision making. But that's what happens when you have a stake in a community initiative. So these are just some examples um, to whet the appetite of community and collaborative approaches to building sort of resilience in a regional context. Rain Ollie, uh, that was an interesting approach to cooperatives, especially cooperatives in the 21st century. So we are, um, we are now um, going to have a quick look back in time. Um, and we've got Liam McGinley from Glen Colum Kill, uh, who wrote the brilliantly titled A Revolution in Their Hands about the, the work um, celebrating the work of uh, Father James McDyer up in, in Donegal. So hopefully this is his first time now presenting in Zoom. So Liam, can you unmute yourself? Are you okay to come in? I'm going to spotlight your video now. Hello. Um, hope, you, hope you can hear me. Uh, I wrote a book in 19... Uh, in 2007, on Father McDair, uh, looking back at his life, and uh, there wasn't anybody else uh, seemingly ready to write the book at the time, so I took it on my hands, as I knew probably more than many, that uh, what, uh, what uh, an extraordinary story was uh, in the McDair story, and how how it was almost uh, a legendary folk tale in one sense about a priest who arrived at the Glen Column Kill in 1950-51 on a bicycle and uh, he, he eventually found the parochial house and uh, when he had a look around the place after a few weeks he made the uh, he made the famous statement that is comprises the, the title of my book. Little did they think what they had a revolution on their hands because here he was a priest who was spent the early part of his ministry in London during the Blitz. It was a time of great trial for for all Londoners and indeed everybody in Britain and Ireland and. <clears throat> Father McDair spent a long time in London during the Blitz, cycling around from place to place by the Irish, uh, where he, he knew his people and giving them help and support. And he learned a lot from the Blitz, and that's why I'm mentioning it. He, he learned about resilience and about determination and dogged determination at that sometimes with the bombs flying about and uh, when he came to Glen Column Kill in 1951 he realized that Glen Column Kill was uh, a, a very quiet backward re region of Donegal it was probably the remotest part of Donegal and that the place needed 
some revitalization big time. And uh, so he, he had a think about it and it is, uh, he realized that he, what he called the five courses of Glen Colin Hill at the time. And one of them was emigration, that the place was being drained of its vital population of the younger people. And they were going to Britain. And he had already met many immigrants in Britain during the war. And he wasn't too pleased about the state in which they had to live because it was quite often very difficult. They were not educated people. They had very little resources and they were trying to make their way in a foreign country. A big problem. And uh, when he began his work in Glen Cullum Kill, he, he looked about and he understood that the male uh, the male example that was traditional in the Irish in Irish history going back hundreds and if not thousands of years, where people gather together to bring in the hay, the harvest, occasionally they would help each other uh, so that the, after they came a good day, several of them could gather together and get one farmer's work completed in one day, maybe get us all his hay in or whatever. And that, and then when the next good day would come, they would go to the next door neighbor to another farmer and they would do the same. As well as that, they used the same system in the fishing industry. When the herring would come in, maybe the boats that would go out occasionally, the boats and they would uh, fish herring. And that was the way partly how they lived at that time. Uh, but Father McDair had, he realized because he was a man of the cloth and he was preaching Catholicism at the time, uh, though people, some people said he was a better businessman than he was a priest, which is probably true as well. He was both, I would think. But uh, then uh, he, he happened upon, uh, as a priest, uh, as, a, as, a, as a clergyman, businessman at the time, which was very unusual, and he wasn't very well appreciated by the church or by government because the church thought he was stepping outside the comfort zone and he was showing other people maybe that they weren't doing enough for their countrymen. And uh, MacDyer always said uh, in the sermons, he said that religion was both uh, horizontal and vertical. The vertical was the prayer, the prayer mass and the, the prayers and but the, the, the horizontal was reaching out to other people and making the community a better place to live in. And that was what really became his mot great motivation. And uh, he began then, the first thing he did when he, he looked around, he realized that there, uh, that th there was no industry, there was no water, nobody had pipe water, and uh, there, there was nothing to keep really keep people generate income for the people on the land. So he, 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 he the first thing he did was to build a community hall. And uh, the hall was built in 10 weeks. He gathered a load of people uh, and he, gave, he put them on a rota of so many each day. And everybody decided to, to row in and help out. And they had the, uh, uh, quite a big parish hall built in 10 weeks, mostly built with a lot of, there was a lot of stone used, it wasn't all even blocks, but they had a block machine and they used that as well. And they finished the hall in 10 weeks and um, at the end of it, uh, after mass that evening, they took them on, uh, they, they, uh, they, they lifted them shoulder high on a chair and carried them all the way through the village to the hall and uh, as a mark of uh, probably <laughs> respect, but uh, that's how they showed their appreciation for it. Father McDyer once said, boasted, he said, we have the, the, the only people's hall from here to Beijing, which was a humorous, uh, he, was, he had quite a good sense of humor, and that was just a humorous thing about uh, the people owning the hall, and uh, that, was, uh, that was that. Um, then uh, he, he began agriculture shows. Uh, he, he realized that 
to get people interested in and have pride in pr the production of vegetables and their own goods and their knitwear and their handicrafts and this making that they should hold a very a big good big show every year and have all this work put on display and that he did as well and he did that very effectively but in 1954 before even some of this stuff began he there was no electricity in glen Cullen hill and the ESB had no intention of bringing any electricity from the Carrick, the other half of the, the parish, to the Glen Cullen Hill because it was going to require 900 poles in Bogland because Glen Cullen Hill, the valley of Glen Cullen Hill, is surrounded by five miles above. And uh, it's a kind of an island, actually. So he, he, by persuasion of all sorts, he managed to get people to the uh, DSB to agree if he could get 200 names of people willing to take the electricity. And that he got, he went door to door and found the people to, uh, to, uh, to sign, the, uh, sign a, a petition to the ESB to have the electricity brought from Carrick into Glen Conkill. And that was the beginning, one of the great, uh, greatest thing he did, because when they switched on the light, it was, uh, and his, uh, his poetic way, he, he said it was almost like switching on the new age, the new world of electricity that we have now, computerization. It was just beginning then. And uh, if, if, if he had not been as pushy as he was uh, and determined, the electricity may have taken a lot longer to get to Glen Conkill, but be that as it may. Then he attempted, one of his great uh, schemes was, uh, to, uh, during his Save the West campaign was to um, develop a model farm. A model farm, he realized that Impressive. all the small farms weren't viable as, as five, most farmers had five acres or six, but he managed to persuade 114 small farmers to a commune uh, to come together and to have a large, one large industrial farm so that they could have uh, economies on machinery and economies on labor. And they would have, uh, to back up the farming, they would have uh, industry, they would introduce industries for the surplus workers, but they would employ as many workers as they needed on the, the, the farm, uh, on the communal farm. Now, the communal farm didn't get government approval. They wouldn't give it grant aid. And the banks wouldn't give Father McDair enough money to launch it on his own because the banks were, at that time, didn't loan much money. It was very difficult to get money at that time. Uh, then he had, uh, he had a weaving mart, which employed about 26 people. He got that started. In 1955, and uh, he, he he went. He wrote to David Lera for permission to uh, to get an industry and to get support for an industry, a weaving industry in Glen Column Kill. So David Lera, who was great interest in Father McDair, and Father McDair was very lucky to have David Lera take such a great interest. But in, in order to ensure that David Lera got the message. Father McDair wrote to Sinead Van de Valera, de Valera's wife as well, and uh, de Valera invited him up to Dublin, and uh, he, uh, Jack Lynch was de Valera's uh, private secretary at the time, and uh, Jack Lynch, uh, Dev said to uh, Jack Lynch, give them whatever they want, and uh, that was the start of the Weaving Mart, and through the persistence of Father McDair, he brought that was another very important 26 jobs into the area, and uh, that was, uh, you know, it, it was a good, uh, a good start, good solid jobs with a steady income every week. Now, then, he, uh, the the uh, the farms and Glen Column Kill, well, the communal farm didn't succeed, but other Father McDowell decided uh, on an experimental situation. They managed, one farmer on, on an acre of land managed to produce 800 pounds, money pounds, uh, with of vegetables of one acre. And this gave great uh, courage to Father McDair that even with 
fairly average land that land quality wasn't that great. Uh, some of it was good, but that maybe they could uh, grow vegetables to supply the hotels and the uh, the catering houses of Ireland. So he 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 began to uh, think in terms of uh, of vegetables, but. Then he struck an idea, well, why not a canning factory for to, to have canned vegetables and create another 40 or 50 jobs? Well, he did that, and that factory is still going today, and, and uh, it's, it's canning fish and it's producing fish at the moment, but it is it employs 200 people at present, up, and up to 200 in the winter time. So uh, a lot of good work was done by Father there. I can't go into do it in too much detail. Obviously, I don't, I'm not too sure how much time I have left yet, but, uh, uh, yeah. hello. Yeah. That'd be great. Huh? To sum up, sorry, I can't hear you. You're out of time, Liam, so if you could- oh, Okay, all right, I'll leave it, I, I'll say, well, Father McDerry has died in 1987, uh, but uh, his ideas and his folk village and uh, many of his projects are still still in place. And the idea of self-help and community self-help was his priority. And, uh, and today on this seminar, uh, that obviously is the key, uh, the key topic. And, uh, and I'm glad to be able to tie into that a little bit. Thank you. Brilliant, Liam. Thank you for that. Um, really inspiring. It was like a story from the future, not a story from the past. Uh, it sounds like that would make a great film. Like, uh, what was that film called, Ollie? That we, Jimmy's Hall. Like Jimmy's Hall, yeah. yeah. So, um, Liam, thanks for that insight into McDyer's work, how important that is, and a lot of the ideas around community ownership, that sort of mutual aid, the, the metal, the coming together and the looking especially at our essentials like food and energy in a different way and there's now a huge opportunity uh, to really localize around those two food and energy and um, that would make a huge difference in our actual resilience and ability to cope so we're going to take a little comfort break in, in about 15 minutes, but there's an opportunity now for us to weave together these different insights to sort of explore if we can identify some patterns that we could bring in uh, to this longer paper uh, and, and, um, and really get a sense of how do we make a just recovery, a just transition in the context of an ecological and climate emergency? How do we do more ourselves? How do we create local wealth, local value? How do we ensure uh, that we can cope uh, with the, the changes that are coming? So I don't know if anyone uh, if in chat, if you could put H or hand up, because I, I can't see everyone on the screens. There's too many of us. But if anyone would like to, to start the conversation, I might just um, ask Ollie. Uh, Ollie, here we are. Um, do you identify any patterns there? So obviously I saw huge patterns from what Liam was talking about in Donegal in the 50s to the sort of things that we're doing in community supported agriculture or you're seeing in Club Jordan or even now using digital tools like the Open Food Network to, to aggregate the value or to ensure that we get local food to market. So you, you identify any patterns? Yeah, I suppose <clears throat> looking at the, the chat as well, there's... There's a great wealth of resources in there already. Uh, I suppose people are starting to pull connections with some, you know, bigger, bigger kind of ideas that organisations like FASTA would have been, you know, developing over the years on like um, land tax. There's reference to Jason Hickel's new book and the sort of jobs guarantee idea in a sort of degrowth kind of perspective. I think there's a lot of thinking kind of coming together after Shade's presentation as well about you know, combining degrowth and reparations um, as one kind of package that the two together make sense and either on their own wouldn't be enough. Um, yeah, and I suppose what's nice as well is people are picking up on things they hadn't seen before, but also then uh, finding connections with stuff that some of us might not have seen either, like about um, appropriate technology. There's a long history of that. Yeah. Um, 
An appropriate digitization is probably what we need now. Open Food Network is an open source community owned platform. It's not proprietary, it's not owned mm. by venture capitalists, it's not extracting wealth uh, from us sharing our stuff or, 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 or engaging with each other uh, to shareholders. So the appropriateness is, is, is interesting yeah. from that sort of appropriate technology we have. Yeah, even the fact that already other digital farmers markets were sold to venture capitalists and co-opted and you know, pulled out of the UK in the case of um, food assembly. So like, it's a real fear. Um, so that's why we have to get it right. Because digitization is coming on a different level now, partly because of COVID. Um, so we have to kind of get the open food network type approach in early because otherwise, you know, other ones will take over like the, the more proprietary. Brilliant. So we are asking you to come in now. So H in the chat, H for hand, I'd like to come in. If we, it'd be great to hear some other voices. And we're trying to weave together, see big and patterns, weave together uh, these different aspects that we're seeing. So anyone, would you like to come in and join us? Just let, uh, indicate and I can spotlight you. Okay, well, maybe you're not gonna, maybe we're just gonna, maybe it'll just be me and Ollie having a conversation here on our own. Um, oh, Janice has raised her hands. Uh, Janice. Can you unmute yourself and come in? Yes, I, I'm not sure that what I'm going to say is all that helpful. Um, I'm, I'm probably the eldest person here. I'm in my early 80s, but um, I came originally from Wales. And in the 60s, I was sort of hopping between. I had jobs in Ireland, in Wales. And I remember the, uh, yeah. the excitement about the Father McDyer thing. And I first heard about it on a BBC program when I was in Wales, and it was later that it sort of hit the headlines more in Ireland. Um, and um, I'm wondering, did that contribute directly to the founding of the co-ops in the Aran Islands and other places, communities around Ireland? I think they came later. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. I mean, we're, yes, you're making a good point. Was McDyer's work uh, before the flourishing of co-ops? I think we went further back to the, to the Rochdale, Rochdale pioneers in the UK. Um, we had Plunkett and E. e. Russell going around the country uh, before McDyer. So there's quite a lot there. Let's, uh, let's see if we can just keep weaving that together. David Somerville, uh, who I know and um, is, coming in from Scotland. Uh, I was at an event on Sunday uh, with David Somerville. Uh, so David, I'm just going to spotlight you if you unmute yourself. Uh, uh, thank you so much um, for, for joining us uh, with the, at the Scottish, at the General Assembly of Scottish Community Climate Action Network the other day. Great uh, inspiring contribution, thank you. Um, uh, like many networks and, and uh, um, local movements for change, um, we do struggle with these um, platforms and, and so on. Um, in one charity I'm involved in, uh, we're using the G Suite, the Google's um, uh, whole panoply of stuff um, that, that uh, um, we can use uh, free because they're charging lots of people lots of money and uh, registered charities can do it. Now I understand uh, Davy, and it may be through your work with Ecolise, um, that there is some work going on in Europe to try and explore um, such a way of holding information. Is it slack, you know? <laughs> um, and so I'd be grateful if you could share, just picking up on that last point um, that was being made about um, trying to establish an independent, um, open source maybe, uh, mechanism yes. for holding uh, in a reasonably secure way um, our conversations, our, our collective memory, our history, and our decisions, um, that would be helpful. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. Yeah, I think um, the work we're doing at the European level, so David refers to I'm part of a meta network of community-led initiatives right across Europe. I think there's 48 members now, national networks, leader networks, transition towns and eco-village networks. Uh, one of the things that we're highlighting there is obviously 
we're now very familiar in doing our conferences, our meetings in these environments. We're open to open up to blended uh, and distributed events where we can still meet in smaller groups. But just the point I think David's making is worth highlighting is we are currently using a very proprietary uh, digital tools that are owned by the, the most powerful and richest people in the world. And we really need, a bit like McDyer in the 50s, we need to be making sure that we have ownership of those tools and, and assets. And there's ways we can do that by looking at open source, which are uh, developed by the communities and owned by the communities and can't be taken away by us. So I think there's just something to highlight there that we need to, in a sense, de-Google. We need to move away from these proprietary platforms into something that we've got much more control of that can actually be of assistance uh, in the, the sense of uh, a tool for conviviality or a, a human scale tool uh, that can aggregate value, um, help us uh, distribute in a different way. So we are taking a comfort break. Some people were going, where's the comfort break gone? We are right on time. The comfort break's coming in five minutes, but with a bit more time, um, and I think who else, uh, someone else had their hand up. Deirdre Lane. Deirdre, do you want to unmute yourself and come in with your insight or reflection? Hi. So I was on a fantastic call recently with the Tel Aviv Foundation, and essentially they've got a local um, financial mechanism whereby if you shop local, you get 30% back yourself, and the money is only within the local communities. They've actually advanced it so the local authority benefit system can be paid via the card as well. And if you take the bus, for example, you get sustainability points too. So it's in your interest to support local, local shop local, and the money stays hyper-locally as well. I thought it was a really interesting model if the community could open it, open and own it. I just thought I'd share it here in this platform. Yeah, thanks for that, Deirdre. I do think that that sort of community control, community ownership uh, could be interesting. That's okay. <laughs> you press it. Sorry, so we're just on that little yeah. breakdown here. Um, so, yes. And actually, Deirdre, could you put that, could you stick that in the um, chat as well, Deirdre, just the name of the actual um, initiative? It's a really good initiative, but my fear then was the government could own it, and then they would only select the people that they would allow to go into the shops. So, for example, if a shop in Clock Jordan wasn't favoured by the government, they wouldn't have them in the loop, which is why it's very interesting to take that model and ensure that the community vet who goes in and where the money can be spent. Yeah, I definitely think we can move a scale up in community ownership or moving a scale up from shop local. And I, I think the community supported agriculture movements where you're joining uh, the CSA and you're an owner subscriber, uh, you're supporting that, uh, that farm, those producers. We, we've taken that model here, a subscription model where our award-winning baker, Rye, Rye, has a bread club. So we're supporting that business by subscribing, not just to remember to buy that local bread, but actually subscribing to that business so that when Joe's baking on a Monday morning, he knows he's sold a number of loaves. He's got that guaranteed cash flow from the community. So we've got an egg club, a milk club, a buyer's club for Whole Foods, as well as our CSA. And I just think that model is probably tying us a bit more into uh, community ownership. What, 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 what do you think, Ollie? Yeah, and what's nice about it as well is that there's enough to be doing with that stuff to actually avoid going into the supermarket. Certainly, you might go to the supermarket once a month rather than once a week, which ties back into the very initial points with Sean there, Sean McCabe, about the um, supermarket power. Like, if you have five or six clubs that you're a member of supplying your food, you can kind of get away with the local shop in town to supplement, which actually also builds the local economy. So then you're at a point whereby it's quite rare then to go into to do the big shop, which used to be a weekly thing for a lot of people. So that's what's nice about that aggregation. It's, it actually can benefit local retailers as well. Like so, I do think, Ollie, there's definitely uh, something important there. Again, it's like uh, we're, we're, we're missing a sort of uh, capacity to imagine uh, a different way of meeting our needs. And when we talk about, say, CSA or these subscription things, people are all, that's a brilliant idea. How come I've not heard of these things in the media? Um, so I think we need, there's a bit of work there, almost like Plunkett and E. Russell 
uh, hundred years ago, you know, showing that there's different approaches that actually could make our regions uh, much more resilient. And, and the sort of approach we take here is an ecosystem approach, which is underpinning the new solidarity or, or multi-stakeholder co-ops or what we saw and what we see in Mondragon or in the past up in Donegal. But the idea that we can uh, come together to meet our needs, uh, the multi-stakeholder solidarity is we can have different types of membership. We don't all have to be consumers or workers. Uh, we could have uh, co-ops now that be multi-stakeholder. And the Open Food Network of Ireland is with ICOS uh, trying to show uh, a 21st century approach to cooperatism and register OFN Ireland as a uh, multi-stakeholder solidarity co-ops. Okay, I, we are, unless anybody wants to come in, there's no H's in the chat or anyone's got their hand up. So I'm gonna suggest we take a five minute comfort break. And in that comfort break, I'd like you just to consider, because that's what we're gonna explore when we come back, what would be the, the, um, the jobs, the livelihoods, the services that would, uh, would emerge when we shorten supply chains and think about our regions in a different way. So that's our objective. Um, and we're gonna explore that together when we, we come back from this comfort break. Um, we, we can look at that in, in breakouts. I, I will break out into smaller groups. Just have a good chat. So thank you all so far. Uh, we've another 40 minutes to go. So if you can, stay with us. Uh, take a little bit of a comfort break right now. We're back in, let's say 10 minutes. Give ourselves 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, we'll come back. But we're exploring then, what are the livelihoods, the jobs, the services that would result of this community-led cooperative approach to our regional resilience? So we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> five or 10. I think David meant 10 minutes. He did, David, thank you. 10 minutes, take your time, look after yourself.
I'm done. We'll change the overall. So we are going to come back soon. So thanks for um, thanks for staying with us. Uh, we're still at thirty people, which is okay. We're going to have a good conversation, I think. So as people are arriving, let's see who's in the room. Rachel, good to see you. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. It's good to see quite a few people from FASTA, um, which has been doing amazing work for the last 20 years, since 1998. And um, work of Richard Douthwaite. Uh, Caroline mentioned Short Circuit in the chat. It was a quite pivotal book for me, looking at how we think about our regional resilience way back then. So a few of you are visible. That's great to see. Uh, well done, Liam. You did really well uh, for your first Zoom call. I do think you should make the feature film of that, uh, that story. It's, uh, it's, it's more complete than, what was the one? The one that, the, uh, Jimmy's Hall. It's more complete than Jimmy's Hall. Mm. David Korovich, good to see you. David was uh, very active in FASTA, uh, wrote an amazing paper that I still, it uh, gives me nightmares, called the Korovich Crunch, or that's what we ended up calling it, David, I can't remember. That was the paper, and I think you've revised it recently. Thanks for joining us here. Do come in, David, if you want to say some of the... No, no, I'll um, come in later. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so people are waking up now, they're coming back. Thanks everyone. Um, we're going to move on. So <clears throat> I think we're going to finish a little earlier. So don't think we'll, we'll be staying here to 4.30 if we don't need to, but we've two big pieces to do. We're going to uh, explore now, especially for the paper that we're doing. We really want to tease out what are the jobs and livelihoods? And I say livelihoods more than jobs because we know what we think can work. Uh, I, you know, we need probably more the Charles Handy portfolio of, 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 of jobs now, um, but not the insecurity of the gig economy. So we're rethinking work, we know that, but livelihood is important. How do we create livelihood in our regions? How do we um, ensure that our regions are healthy and resilient? So. These are the things that we're looking at. So what we want to do in this breakout is trying to list and get into the chat so that we can harvest it, the jobs, livelihoods, services that will emerge from a just recovery, just transition in the context of climate change, focus on our regions. And we say regions more than we might have said communities in the past, that we've been very involved in the transition town process thinking about how our neighborhoods, our streets, and our communities can be more resilient, but really it's the relationships with the producers of energy and food and other vital services across our regions that will really give us, we think, the sense of resilience and be able to cope with the vulnerabilities of long supply chains uh, and uh, the vulnerability of the global economy, uh, so there's, there's a lot to think about here, but that's what our objective is to look at the, um, trying to list as many things that we can go into in a bit more detail. So we're gonna go into the breakouts for, um, let's give it a good bit of time. This is a small groups, it's random. We don't know who will be in your group, but we'll probably have about 25, 30 minutes to really get into a bit of a conversation. And please use the chats if you can, because that's where we harvest. That's where we can pull together the insights generated from your chat. So when we go into the chat room, there's no facilitators, no moderators. It'd be good to just say hello and who you are, but not to go into too much detail. And um, stay focused on the mission and objective. Our mission in this little breakout is to explore the jobs, the livelihoods, the services, uh, local services that will emerge and adjust our local um, transition. So before we go into the breakout rooms, 
Is anyone sitting with on any uncertainty that we can resolve now? Ollie, can you watch and make sure there's... Yeah, I'm just making sure you can be heard as well, Debbie, because there was a message wondering. Um, so is there, are we... Yeah, we're, all, we're audible, fully audible, yeah? We are, we're on. Um, yeah. If someone is visible who's got the camera on, just give us a thumbs up if you can hear us. Me and Ollie might be talking to ourselves here. Great, hey, thank you. Thank you, Rajin. Okay, and is anyone sitting with any uncertainty, not knowing what we're doing? Oh, there's a few people stuck in the waiting room. Sorry, if they weren't. If you could type in the in the chat now on what we're doing in this time, that would be very helpful. Thanks, David. So, and let's see if I can do that. Multitask. Very simple, though. We're having a conversation around the sort of jobs and livelihoods that we can imagine in a just recovery or a just transition in the context of shortening supply chains and strengthening local economies. David, I'll, I'll find that and I'll put it in the chat for you. Anyone else before we go in? I came back a bit late and I missed the um, invitation in the chat room. Liz Cullen here. Hi, Liz. Hi, I, I, I came back a bit late from the break and I think I missed the invitation. Okay, so the invitation is in small groups. Oh, no, I didn't get, oh yeah, but I didn't get the invitation. So here's the invitation. I'm giving you this. The invitation in small groups is to have a conversation around the sort of jobs, livelihoods, and services that we can see or imagine in the just transition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so remember to um, not to go down too many rabbit holes, too many tangents, stay focused on that issue, but introduce yourself when we go in to the rooms now. So I'll pull you out in about 25 minutes. We'll have a bit of time uh, to look at um, weaving together those insights before we have our European reflection from Stanka from uh, Friends of the Earth Europe. Okay, so are we okay? I'm gonna pull you into rooms. You may get in a room and people are sleeping or knocking back from the break. Just work with it and <laughs> hopefully it'll all go well. So you're being invited to the breakout rooms now. <laughs> One thing people are wondering about is, um, you know, the rural and midlands and stuff that scale has a bit of going on there. We can yeah. just talk about everything, but it's like it is better if it's a little bit focused. Do you want to join that group? Well, that was that was a general chat. I, I'm happy in any group. You're in a group, so yeah. Um, I'm in a group. Of, with, you've not joined, so you have to go and join. Okay, I'll do that out here. <clears throat> Don't panic if it's slow to get you into the rooms. You should be, or maybe this is a room here. That's um, a room, yeah. Anne, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, Orla, it looks like this is a breakout room. And, um, Unless I can, Deirdre, are you are you still at your computer? No. Anne, can you hear me? Just nod your head. I can just to see if I can get you in a room. <coughs> Anne, Anne, can you hear me? You hear me, Anne? Can you hear me? Just checking and 
if you hear me now, I think you've got your sound down. I can still see you, but you're not joining the group. Ah. Rachel, can you hear me? Tommy, can you hear me? Yes, I can, David. Just pop back in. Sorry about that. You can go to your room. There should be a button that you can go to your room that you're assigned to. Uh, where is that now? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Rachel, did you get lost? You're muted. No, I was insulted by Judy Osborne, and I'm not going back. <laughs> you could just keep her... Her, her opinions to herself about, about whatever she thinks. Yeah, she made remarks. She doesn't approve of what I do with my life. And she can fuck off. And I, you know, I, I don't deserve to be treated like this. I'm making a documentary which is going to help a lot of people with a, a very well-known publishing company who are... I, I'm very upset by what Judy Osborne said to me. I think she's wrong. I think she's a bigoted bitch. And I'm not going back. And I'm sorry. I'm not going back into that blanket room and I'm not going to spend 25 minutes giving her fucking ideas because she doesn't have the right to take my dignity like that. Okay, Rachel. Goodbye. Sorry that you had that experience. Um, so you just want to stay here? You don't want, oh, you're leaving. You've left. Okay. Anne, can you hear us? No. Okay. You know, tied into to, 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 to bad housing, uh, bad housing stock in a lot of cases. So this can, can bring that down. So that that would be one area that we I, I, I would um, I would focus on in terms of local local employment. You know, obviously there is going to be a lot of food, and um, but I think you know the the, the cost of of transporting from Anne, can you hear me? Can you hear me now by any chance? Yeah. 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 Hey! God, I had to click a lot of buttons. <laughs> <sighs> Hello. We can hear you. Do you want to feed in Orlo? Because we obviously weren't able to get anything from you so uh up until now. Um yeah, I'll just just keep going. I was listening, but I'll I'll add in something when when I feel I need to. <laughs> Um, just out of curiosity. 
is where mm. I live. And it will be quite different from, you know, a rural town or um, a large... City. I was thinking uh, when they were talking about the farm machinery where, you know, the kind of common ownership of farm machinery. Yeah. Um, I mean, Ireland has gone directly in the other direction. I mean, when I was growing up on a farm, we did help the neighbours bring in their harvest. Mm. And we always had a barn dance at the end of the harvest. And it was more of a community affair. But over the years, um, all of that stopped. And then you had these big contractors who bought enormous machinery at extraordinary sums of money. And then they went, um, those big contractors then went around cutting the corn doing all the, the harvesting and that kind of got rid of the community effort you know so we, we've moved away from whatever it is they're doing in France um, I don't know why that is um, and then the, the guys um, I mean have you ever been in one of those machines they're extraordinary they're air conditioned they have you know um, fantastic music systems <laughs> It's something further away from farming. You couldn't get some of them, you know, and how they can afford them, I don't know. It's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so the new jobs, yeah, I don't know whether it is. Um, I mean, we have to think what they're trying to what they're trying to get at today is that we shorten the supply chains because that's what makes us resilient. That we're not relying on Tesco getting a lorry in from a port in England to stock up our supermarkets. Well, again, talking about food in particular, I did try and do a 50 mile diet at one point. Um, but I got now I was going to allow myself coffee. But um, other than that, um, I got stuck because um, I find it very difficult eating very heavy wheat and bread and things like that. And the only wheat that we can grow in Ireland um, isn't suitable for soft bread um, or even for
Did you get thrown out of the room, Ben? It told us it told us we had zero time left, so we left. Oh. The timer ran down. Okay. So then yeah, it said zero time left, and so then we clicked on leave room. Okay. Well, who was in your room? Just Anne, Ben, and Liam, or uh, Sean? And me, Abby. Oh, there's more of you there. There's... Sorry about that. Uh, it, I didn't time it properly. No one else is coming out of the rooms. <laughs> Perhaps you can uh, continue your conversation in this room. For another five minutes, and then we'll break up the rooms. I can't put you back. That's my problem. You can't do that, then. I can't see how to put you back. No, now that you've came out, I'd have to create another breakout room. Anyway, there's no one else here. Anne's not here. Sean, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Sorry. Okay, so I think just continue the conversation here. I mean, I suppose going through the rooms, I went to the different rooms, um, people are having good conversations, but they're probably not going to harvest that. So maybe in the last 10 minutes, we could maybe just think about what are we bringing back from our small group conversation. If you want to continue here, I'm going to just jump into the other rooms and let them know um, that they're, we've got 10 minutes left. So I think we didn't actually talk, talk about what we were supposed to talk about, do we? <laughs> <laughs> Which was jobs. Um, yeah, like in, this, in, the donut eco economics is interesting. The, the old yeah. plugging the leaks kind of ideas. Um, how do you keep money circulating in local economies? And that's really a personal choice to yeah you know, not, not spend as much outside of your community and see it, see money actually circulating in, in a local area. 